to go. I down. saw you with the box. What was in the box? Seven ends on a devastating reveal. Brad Pitt's Detective David Mills discovers the severed head of his wife, Tracy, lying in a box, the latest victim of the serial killer he's been tracking. It seems that envy is my sin. Uh that killer, who's known only as John Doe, taunts Mills by telling him Tracy was pregnant. She begged for her life. Shut up. And for the life of the baby inside of her. Ah! He goads Mills into killing him, forcing Mills into fulfilling the final act of his master plan. Become vengeance, David. Become wrath. So when Mills shoots John Doe, it doesn't feel like a triumph over evil. It's a defeat. If you kill him, he will win. It's a bleak ending to an unusually dark film, and it almost didn't happen. As Pitt would later recall, the studio wanted to change it, worried audiences would find it too disturbing. Instead, director David Fincher made a compromise. He added a new voiceover from Morgan Freeman, who played Mills' partner, Detective William Somerset, offering some wearied yet resolute closing words. Ernest Hemingway once wrote, The world is a fine place and worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. It's a note of optimism compared to everything that came before, but it also feels slightly hollow. And it leaves us wondering, is the world a fine place? Long is the way and hard that out of hell leads up to light. And what exactly are we fighting for or against? What sick, ridiculous puppets we are. What a gross little stage we dance on. Not knowing that we are nothing. We are not what was intended. Here's our take on how Seven's ending challenges our ideas of order and chaos, sanity and insanity, and right and wrong, posing a difficult question about the world and who we are. I can't wait for you to see. I really can't. It's really going to be something. You're watching The Take. Thanks for watching and be sure to share and subscribe. You know, this isn't gonna have a happy ending. It's not possible. Hey man, we catch him, I'll be happy enough. Seven begins like a classic whodunit, revolving around the hunt for a mysterious killer who takes a high concept approach to murder. When you want somebody dead, you drive by and shoot him. You don't risk the time it takes to do this, unless the act itself has meaning. It's a formula we've seen play out countless times, from Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie to the modern cop show. In this case, Seven's killer is inspired by sin, creating grisly tableaus that suggest his victims are being morally punished. Someone broke into his law firm and bled him to death. Put the word greed on the floor. And because there's an unmistakable order to his plan, we're led to believe the story will proceed in an orderly fashion, with the killer eventually tripped up by his own unmistakable calling card. Seven's protagonists seem immediately recognizable to us too, an archetypal odd couple pair of cops whose conflicting personalities create friction. Imagine my belt says detective, it's the same as yours. Somerset is the wise, world-weary veteran detective on the brink of retirement. This can't be my last duty. It's just gonna go on and on and on. Mills is the hot-headed young rookie, driven by an as-yet untainted idealism. You actually fought to get reassigned here. I've just never seen it done that way before. Thought I could do some good. They're opposites, not just in their age or enthusiasm, but in their faith that their job still has meaning. You want to be a champion. Well, let me tell you, people don't want a champion. They want to eat cheeseburgers, play the lotto, and watch television. Oh, yeah. Mills believes they can follow clues, apprehend the killer, and restore some sense of order to the world. But Somerset has become jaded, believing their job is just a futile pantomime, merely recording and labeling the madness raging around them. Putting everything in the neat little piles and filing it away on the off chance it will ever be needed in the courtroom. This tension between order and chaos is foundational to detective fiction. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's classic Sherlock Holmes stories usually began with someone's domestic bliss being thrown into disarray by some heinous crime. I understand you know something of the Whitechapel murders. I have seen the man known as Jack the Ripper. When the famous detective is called in, his job isn't just to find the missing moonstone or unmask the murderer, it's to re-establish the sense of order which the crime has disrupted. 
Sherlock Holmes reflected and reinforced the Victorian worldview that the world is well-regulated and moral. And even since then, the detective story has continued to provide reassurance that through diligence and determination, order can always be restored. Being a detective is like, well, like making an automobile. You just take all the pieces and put them together one by one. By employing these classic tropes, Seven gives us that same sense of comfort, that no matter how grisly the crime, these mismatched buddy cops will eventually bring the culprit to justice. You, you care. You're damn right. And you're gonna make a difference. By connecting each victim to one of the seven deadly sins, there's also a reassuring sense of structure and finality. There are seven deadly sins, Captain. Each murder moves us closer to that final number seven, at which point we can be certain, one way or another, that this will all be over. Like the rain that lashes the streets throughout the film, this evil we're witnessing is just a dark storm that will inevitably pass. It'll go away in a minute. It's not. But then, John Doe surrenders. Detective! You're looking for me. He turns up at the police station with two murder victims and a full half hour of the movie still to go. And immediately we realize that those comforting genre structures were an illusion. Seven isn't a classic detective story. It's not the protagonist's powers of deduction or determination that will bring the bad guy to justice. I'm telling you, there's no way he would just turn himself in. It doesn't make any sense. Well, there he sits. It's not supposed to make any sense. As David Fincher would later note in his DVD commentary, it starts off as a police procedural and becomes a morality play about engaging with evil. In Seven's climactic scenes, Somerset and Mills must engage with that evil directly. The client says there are two more bodies, two more victims hidden away. He will take Detectives Mills and Somerset to these bodies, but only Detectives Mills and Somerset. It's a surprise that obliterates that comforting structure, knocking the film and the audience off balance and leaving us uncertain about where we're headed. John Doe's head splits open and the UFO should fly out. I want you to have expected it. And more importantly, we're left unsure about who's really in control. This feeling only intensifies during the long car ride that follows, during which John Doe is given the unusual opportunity to discuss his crimes at length and justify his killings. Only in a world this shitty could you even try to say these were innocent people and keep a straight face. Again, the power balance is off. The killer speaks freely, without remorse, but also without fear. You should be thanking me. Why is that, John? because you're going to be remembered after this. And as they reach their destination, it's obvious why. The only reason that I'm here right now is that I want it to be. John Doe has arranged for them all to be here at this exact moment to receive that fateful box. John Doe has the upper hand. Mills must then decide whether to submit to his place in Doe's plan to become wrath and kill him, or to maintain his faith in virtue in a world that no longer holds any for him. You made it a suspect, David. No! Just throw it all away, you know. No! Ultimately, Mills gives in. As screenwriter Andrew Kevin Walker later explained, Seven isn't really about cops catching a killer. It's about the forces of optimism, represented by Detective Mills, being in constant conflict with pessimism, as seen in Detective Somerset. How did you get like this? It wasn't one thing, I can tell you that. Their philosophical struggle mirrors our own in a universe that tests our optimism every day. You want me to agree with you and you want me to say, yeah, 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 you're right, it's all f***ed up, it's a mess, but I won't. I won't say that. In the end, good fails. If we are ruled by chaos, not order, is the world really worth fighting for? Serial killers pose a challenge to the traditional detective story narrative, not only because they reject order, but because they confound our very understanding of people. You just stop and go, wow, it is amazing how crazy I really am. We can rationalize crimes that are committed for material gain or the violence born out of vengeance or passion. Single, he told me. Single my ass. However much they may appall us, because there is at least an element of human connection to them. But someone who kills complete strangers out of sheer compulsion, who treats their victims as inhuman and largely disposable, it damages our sense of who we are. 
If we believe that humankind is essentially decent, that the world is a fine place, then serial killers present an almost incomprehensible obstacle to that philosophy. People will barely be able to comprehend, but they won't be able to deny. This is why, when it comes to serial killers, our first recourse is usually to question their sanity. Why do we gotta sit here, rotting, waiting until the lunatic does it again? It's dismissive to call him a lunatic. Don't make that mistake. In the film, John Doe's mental health becomes an ongoing topic of debate between Mills and Somerset. To the optimistic Mills, someone would have to be deranged to enact those kinds of gruesome murders. Come on, he's insane. But the jaded Somerset has seen the worst of humanity. He knows what so-called normal people are capable of. We are talking about people who are mentally ill. We are talking about people crazies no no yes. we're not. no no Today. We're, we're, we're talking about everyday life here in the real world that desire to label all serial killers insane tends to flounder when it comes up against people like ted bundy jeffrey dahmer or john wayne gacy all of whom were able to spend most of their lives as polite productive citizens like John Doe, they were indistinguishable from ordinary people and mentally competent enough to plan their murders, then repeatedly put them into action. Imagine the will it takes to keep a man bound for a full year. This guy is methodical, exacting, and worst of all, patient. David Fincher's own Netflix series Mindhunter follows the FBI's earliest attempts to understand these sequence killers as they were first known and to delve inside their psyches. We ask, what happened? Why did it happen that way? Which narrows the search for who did it. But what if our killer is someone who's not rational? This approach is what has led to theories like the McDonald Triad, a set of childhood behaviors, bedwetting, pyromania, and cruelty to animals that are said to be early predictors of violent sociopathic tendencies. It's a framework that places the focus on nurture rather than nature. I bet he wasn't born a criminal, Clarice. He was made one through years of systematic abuse. Yet it doesn't fully account for why some people weather their childhood traumas undisturbed and others become remorseless murderers. As Somerset and Mills discover, it's useless trying to get inside the head of John Doe, who is completely unknowable. Even his name remains a mystery. It doesn't matter who I am. Who I am means absolutely nothing. We learn nothing about his background or what might have led him down this dark path. About the only thing we know about that guy right now is he's independently wealthy, well-educated, and totally insane. For his part, Doe insists that he's not fundamentally different from anyone else. I'm not special. I've never been exceptional. This is, though, what I'm doing. John Doe can't be written off as an aberration. It's more comfortable for you to label me insane. It's very comfortable. And this is what allows him to take advantage of an optimist like Mills, who believes himself and most normal people to be inherently superior. So many freaks out there doing their little evil deeds they don't want to do. The voices made me do it. My dog made me do it. By explaining away John Doe's crimes as the depraved actions of a freak, convincing himself that he knows who and what this killer really is, Mills makes himself feel more in command of the world. Murderers lose their power the moment we know them. But Doe refuses to give him an explanation that would allow Mills and the audience to compartmentalize him from the rest of the world. He's preaching. Yeah. He's murders of his sermons to us. When science fails to explain serial killers, we often fall back on simple moral reasoning. Killers are evil. They're monsters, not human. Their heinous acts are a rejection of all that is good in the world. If we catch John Doe and he turns out to be the devil, I mean, if he's Satan himself, that might live up to our expectations. Like the belief that there is an overarching order to life or that killers are somehow different from the rest of us, this idea comforts us keeping us steeped in a Judeo-Christian sense of ethics that promises to reward the righteous and smite the sinner. But Seven subverts this notion as well. We learn that John Doe is not only conscious of good and evil, he believes himself to be righteous. Is that to say, John, that what you were doing was God's good work? The Lord works in mysterious ways. Doe's murders are patterned after Dante's divine comedy, where sinners are punished for their motives, the psychological roots of their sin. Dante and his buddies are climbing up the hill, they're checking out all the sinners, yeah? 
Yeah, seven terraces of purgation. Yeah, yeah. But whereas purgatory provides an ironic or metaphorical punishment, one that's often the opposite of their earthly misdeeds, John Doe coerces his victims to follow their sin to its extreme conclusion. I won't deny my own personal desire to turn each sin against the sinner. The gluttonous man forced to eat himself to death. Killer put a bucket beneath him, kept on serving. The slothful man left to rot away in bed. The vain woman who must choose between living with a disfigurement and committing suicide. Cut off her nose, despite her face. Because they have committed one of those seven deadly sins, according to those same ethics, it's not easy to dismiss Doe as wholly evil or his victims as wholly innocent. Innocent? Is that supposed to be funny? A drug dealer, a, a drug dealing pederast, actually. Doe's murders expose the unforgiving Old Testament threat of retribution that underpins our basic understanding of morals. Don't ask me to pity those people. I don't mourn them any more than I do the thousands that died at Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a reminder that many of the vices we regard as a natural part of the human condition are in fact explicitly condemned affronts to God. We see a deadly sin on every street corner, in every home, and we tolerate it. We tolerate it because it's common. It's, it's trivial. Like a pious, dirty Harry, Doe believes the system of man is rotten beyond redemption, which means taking God's law into his own hands. This is a man who dedicated his life to making money by lying with every breath that he could muster to keeping murderers and rapists on the streets. And again, he's not entirely wrong. When Doe hires his own lawyer, Mills and Somerset see just how easily man's world impedes the path of true moral justice. I am required by law to serve my clients to oh, the best Jesus of my ability and to serve their best interests. Meanwhile, Doe is only able to find and kill Tracy because the police they work with are all so venal and corrupt. It's disturbing how easily a member of the press can purchase information from the men in your precinct. Doe isn't just pointing out how inextricable sin is from humanity, but how numb we've become to it. Mills dismisses the idea that the killings will have any lasting impact, confident they'll be forgotten within a news cycle or two. The funny thing is, all this work, Two months from now, no one's gonna care. And although Mills intends this as an insult, it highlights the very quality of modern life that Doe has been drawing our attention to. Apathy. Wanting people to listen, you can't just tap them on the shoulder anymore. You have to hit them with a sledgehammer. Much as the desire for vengeance connects Doe to Mills, the distaste for apathy is what links Doe to Somerset. I just don't think I can continue to live in a place that embraces and nurtures apathy as if it was a virtue. Somerset recognizes that the world's general lack of concern for others is what enables Doe's crimes, allowing him to imprison a man for a year without anyone noticing, for example, so long as his bills are paid. Yeah, our landlord's dream. Paralyzed tenant with no tongue. Who pays the rent on time. There are parts of John Doe in both detectives, just as there are in us. The fact that some part of us still relishes seeing John Doe die is the film's final twist of the knife, as we subconsciously root for Mills to become wrath. She begged for her life, detective. Shut up! We realize that John Doe's sense of right and wrong is not so far removed from our own. This point is only reinforced by the assurance from his fellow cops that Mills, having just murdered a man in cold blood, will be protected because he did it while wearing a badge. We'll take care of him. In the end, we see how the supposed evil John Doe represents is not really some deviation from the norm. Like sin itself, it's scattered throughout the city, inseparable from the world we live in. The revelation that Tracy was pregnant when she died adds an extra note of shock and tragedy to Seven, yet it's also the completion of an overarching theme. I've been going around, you know, looking at schools. But the conditions here, while investigating what it means to take a life, Seven also probes the question of what it means to create one, offering them as two sides of the same ethical coin. I remember thinking, how can I bring a child into a world like this? How can, how can a person grow up with all this around them? It's the question we all must grapple with. Is this world capable of redemption? Or is that just what we tell ourselves to keep going? Do you like what you do for a living? these things you see? No, I don't. But 
That's life, isn't it? When Seven was first released, critic Roger Ebert noted that Somerset's final line plays more like a bleak joke, offering small consolation to the horrors we've just witnessed. Doe's Pyrrhic victory, Mills's devastating loss, and Somerset being left to wander off alone. But perhaps there's greater consolation to be found in the final words Somerset actually delivers on screen. After he spent the whole film preparing to leave police work and the city behind, Somerset seems to imply he's not going anywhere. Where are you gonna be? Around. I'll be around. He's not willing to give up just yet. Stories like Seven can't comfort us with the notion that evil is an aberration, that every crime will be solved, or that good will ultimately prevail, because the world is not a fine place. So many corpses roll away unrevenged. But bleak as it may be, the film also reminds us that we can only face that world by rejecting apathy and finding the little sparks of human connection within each other that produce just enough light and warmth to keep us going as the darkness thickens. It's a film that allows us the chance to confront that darkness, leaving us with the knowledge that the best we can do is stick around and wake up every morning, ready to head back out into the fray to keep fighting. And what I've done is gonna be puzzled over and studied and followed forever. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all our new videos.